Good afternoon. Nate, that was so cute to see you up here with your tongue suppressors. <laughs> Since we're in prayer, um, I'm going to be in Nehemiah 5, so if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you're on your iPhone or whatever phone you have, that'd be fine too, but we're heading towards Nehemiah 5. Um, but before we jump into that, I'd like to pray for Nate and for Kim. Can we do that? Um, Nate would never say this, but I'll say it. It's really hard to pick up your family and move them across the country. And then it's really hard to plant a new church. And uh, so I just want to pray for them, and I want to bless them. So Alan, would you lean up and put a hand on Nate's shoulder, just kind of symbolically for all of us? Lord Jesus, um, I so love Nate, <laughs> and I so respect Nate, and I so love Kim. And Father, I pray that on this rainy evening that you would um, bless exceedingly their marriage, their home, their finances, their family, Ruthie and Ellie. Father, we lift up Ellie, who I think has 103 fever. Lord, we ask that you would bring um, healing to her body and a swift recovery, protect the other members of the family from getting sick. Father, would you lift Nate's spirit? Would you lift his heart? Would you um, be uh, literally his strength day in and day out in this journey of being a pastor and a leader? Father, we praise you that he's here in Wilmington. We believe that you've called him here, and uh, I, I am watching him influence other leaders and other pastors. So, so excited for that. And God, we pray that you would bless Hope Community and that this would no doubt be a beacon of hope and light and life for this city. And Father, as we're in Live Oak's building, we also pray that you would put a special blessing on Brian and Lindsay and Live Oak Church. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, I'm Michael, and I am thrilled to be with you guys. Uh, I'm in Nehemiah 5, so we'll jump right in. You probably got a little outline as you walked in. Um, if you like outlines, great, follow along, fill it in. If not, use it to scribble on, make a paper airplane, or, you know, whatever, leave it on your seat. Um, but <clears throat> we are in, uh, you are in a series on prayer. Um, and I love Nehemiah because you get to see this guy who starts ministry and life off with prayer. In fact, he's just doing what Nehemiah does. You guys probably already know this, but he's tasting the king's wine and, you know, being the cupbearer to the king. And uh, he has some guys who come back from Israel, from Jerusalem, and he goes, what's happening? You guys know all this, because you just did it a couple of weeks ago. And this, um, he gets this report that grieves him deeply. And here we are, we pick up again in chapter 5, and in chapter 5 we see a similar story unfolding. Because in chapter 5, he is now rebuilding the wall, um, and you see that uh, a group of men and women sort of come forward and go, man, we are being treated unjustly. I think we have those verses to put up, do we? Why don't we put those up? And I'm just going to paraphrase. Um, this is, instead of reading it, I'm going to kind of go through it and paraphrase it. So in this first verse, uh, what we have is we have this, uh, the men and the women are going, man, they, they sort of raise this outcry against their fellow Jews who are treating them unjustly. And they're actually going, um, some of our sons and daughters are, uh, they're so numerous and in order to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. And others are saying we're mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and still others are saying we've had to borrow money and pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. So as you're going through this, what you see is you see Nehemiah respond to where the people are. And I think that brings us to our first point here, is prayer should be born of a divine unction. Prayer should be born of a divine unction. I love this in the life of Nehemiah, because in chapter 1 he responds to a divine unction, and then here again in chapter 5 he hears the outcry. Will you go to verse 6 for me? We're on verse 4 right there, but bump to verse 6. There we go. Um, verse 6 says, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry, and I pondered them in my mind, and then accused the nobles and the officials. And I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So the first thing is, prayer should be born of a divine unction. Now, prayer without unction is difficult for me. I don't know about you guys. But just going through a rote list, that's hard for me at times. I think it's difficult. I think Nate just sat up here and said it was a little difficult for him. But what we see in the life of Nehemiah is a man who really lives a life of prayer. He feels deeply. So we got these people who are, who are being treated unjustly. And this verse doesn't say that he prayed, but it says he heard their outcry. He heard their outcry. And I think that God calls us to be aware 
of the outcry around us. You got, a, you got people who feel and who see deeply. But number one is prayer born of divine unction. The second thing that we see here is prayer as an expression of relationship. So Nehemiah has, you see two things in his life. He's got this really, um, you really see an intimate relationship with God expressed here. And then you see a relationship that's developing between he and the people. So we have prayer born of relationship. You know, I was thinking of um, Moses. And in Exodus 33, I didn't put this on your screen, but it actually says Moses um, spoke to the Lord face to face as one speaks to a friend. That is prayer born of relationship. And I think many times us as Christians, we're really good at kind of the bookends of Christianity. We're good at the um, come to Christ, surrender your life. We're probably even good at um, the other bookend, which is Christ is going to come back and take us to heaven. But we have this life in between, don't we? And you start seeing in the Pauline New Testament, and you even see in some of these guys and, and women of the Old Testament, that they are actually um, walking in this day-by-day -day relationship with Christ Jesus. So you have prayer that is born then out of relationship. Nehemiah hears this outcry, and he hears the charges, and he was angry. There's a, um, there's a book that I love. It's, called, uh, it's by a guy named Brother Lawrence. Anybody heard of him? few people. Yeah, it's a really, really, really good book. Um, but it's called Practicing His Presence. And one of the things he talks about in there is he's washing dishes, and he is sort of having these sort of breath prayers or this conversational prayers with the Lord. It's prayer born of relationship. It's not a one-way thing. You're actually interacting uh, with the Lord. You know, uh, Paul, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians maybe 5, but he talks about praying continually. Or praying without ceasing. That's pretty intimidating to me. I don't know about you guys. But pray continually. Anybody do that? I don't want to raise your hand there, do you? Me either. <laughs> pray continually. Pray without ceasing. But I think in the life of Nehemiah here in chapter 5, what we're seeing is someone who is living a life of prayer. See, anytime a divine unction comes up, he takes it to the Lord in prayer. He lives out of that. Then number two, he's got this relationship with the Lord, relationship with the people. And I think pray continually means interact with the Lord Jesus as you're going about your day. If you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a stay-at-home dad and you're in the middle of a mess with one of your kids, what are you doing? Do you have to stop everything and tell everybody to go to their room and get your journal out? No. You pray right there, Lord Jesus, how do I deal with this son or this daughter? You're in the middle of a marriage. You're in the middle of a fuss in your marriage. I call a timeout in my own mind all the time, and I'm like, whoa, Lord Jesus. This is my best friend. This is the person I love more than anybody on the planet. See, we make prayer this thing where you've got to like, go through a list or you've got to um, you know, have this formal time or this formal place, and that's good. I know people who have a prayer chair or a prayer closet or a prayer this, and all that's good. I'm not saying not to have that. But I think that prayer that is an expression of ongoing and consistent relationship with the Lord is really what we see throughout Scripture. And it, those are the most powerful prayers. I don't want a one-way sort of um, prayer. I want that interactive prayer that's born of relationship. And I think we see that in Nehemiah, and we see it certainly throughout his life as we unfold uh, in, in the book of Nehemiah. So the third thing, as we're kind of moving along here, I'm also going to be in verse 6 on this. Oh, actually, keep it right there. That's great. I'm going to read verse 6, and then we'll go to verse 7. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. So he gets upset. I pondered them, verse 7, in my own mind, and I accused the nobles and officials. So the third point is our frustration. We could even say anger, but our frustration can be a prompting from the Lord to prayer and to action. Abby and I parent like this sometimes. There's something going on at home. There's something going on with one of our kids. And instead of reacting immediately, we're going to pray about it. Before we take action. You know, I think this can also be as simple as a business you're wanting to start. A neighbor you want to go reach out to. Prayer, it's, it's like... Um, you know, if, if there's something, and, uh, something that is welling up within you, pay attention to that thing. You know what I'm talking about? You ever driven past a neighbor's house and you have a little 
a little something in your heart, you ought to reach out and talk to them. You know what I'm talking about? It's a little unction from the Lord. It's a little, it's just a little thing where the Lord is rising up that you would maybe pray and maybe take action. But our frustration can be a prompting from the Lord. I read about um, Christine Kane in the start of A21. You guys, anybody familiar with that? It's a, it's a powerful um, sort of movement. She started uh, to end um, sex trafficking across the nation and really around the world now. And that was started out of her anger and frustration. You see the same thing here with Nehemiah. He's like, he's got this outcry because these people are be, being treated poorly. And it's really a prompting from the Lord. How many times do we dismiss those type of little frustrating things in our lives? Come on, if you're like me, you try to bury them, don't you? I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to feel impatient. I don't want to feel frustrated. I don't want to feel whatever it is. And what if those things aren't a little thing from the Lord where he's going, hey, you need to pray about this. Or maybe I'm calling you to take action. Many businesses were started because people had some type of frustrating situation. They're like, I'm going to do something about this to change it. Churches were started. I imagine Nate and Kim were sitting in Colorado and they had some sort of unction. It was time to leave Colorado. Time to move forward. Maybe it was a frustrating thing. It could have even been an impatient thing. It could have been an angry thing at moments. But it was like God was putting on their heart that this was the time. And they went to prayer and ultimately took action. So I think our frustration, third point, can be a prompting from the Lord to prayer and to action. I, you know, I, I sort of think about this as um, almost like the Popeye effect. You guys remember the Popeye cartoon? I've had all I can take and I can't take anymore. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, that's kind of what we're going here. When something is happening in your life and it's, it's, uh, it's frustrating or it's bothering or, you know, it might be that the Lord is calling you to do something. I strongly say, call a time out and begin to think and pray and go, Lord, what do you, is there something you want me to do here? Because this keeps popping up onto my radar. Also in Nehemiah 5, 7, and I love this. I love verse 7 here. So he's gotten angry, and it says he was angry, and then verse 7 says, I pondered them in my mind, and then I accused the nobles. Number four, prayer and pondering should always precede action. If you guys are like me, man, I get into trouble when I respond quickly without praying and without pondering. I've got a uh, five-year journal that I just love because in it, I'm able to actually see it. Every, so um, if you've ever seen a five-year journal, you open it up, and on any um, page, there's literally five years and five of that exact day. And every year, I'm writing just a few things, a few things I'm praying about, a few themes from our life, a few things that are sort of happening. And what that's doing is it's causing me to sort of dig in and go, what are the themes of my life? What am I praying for? What is happening? And the other thing it's doing, it's actually beyond to strengthen my faith because I'm able to see when he answers prayer. It's really powerful because I can actually look back and go, oh my goodness, I prayed this. Abby and I prayed this together for like a whole year before it actually happened. It's a, it's a faith builder for me. If you don't have a five-year journal, man, uh, the reason I like it too is because it's this, it's like four lines. Journals are intimidating to me. I feel like I got to write pages and pages and pages, but it's like four lines. Like I, I can do this, you know, we can do this. So, number four, prayer and pondering should always precede action. I had a, um, I had a mentor. Um, he was an executive at, at uh, Corning. And he always used to say, Michael, you need to shut your door and have a meeting with yourself. You need to ponder. You need to think. You need to reflect. You need to take it to the Lord in prayer before you just have a knee-jerk reaction. And the older I get, the more I value a methodical, slow, prayerful, pondering response to almost everything in life. Then as we look on down in the chapter, I'm going to skip a few, uh, a few verses. I'm actually going to go to verse 14 if you have it back there. I don't know, if Tommy, if you're switching it or who is, but verse 14 says, Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. 
But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistance also lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on the wall. Number five is fasting and prayer are a powerful combination that can move the hand of God. Now, it doesn't say that Nehemiah fasted here, but a fast is merely when you're abstaining from a food or foods, and instead of whatever energy or time or focus you would have put on that, you put into prayer. And Nehemiah is literally saying here, he was governor for 12 years, and he was saying, during those years, I didn't eat the food allotted to the governor. I think it's kind of like a fast. I think he went, I am not going to overburden the people. I'm not going to. I'm going to give this up. I'm going to give this back. I'm going to sacrifice. And there's something powerful about fasting. You guys ever fasted? Anybody? It doesn't, you know, people get real intimidated about fasting. They get all funny. Like, well, I got to fast everything. No, you don't. Fast your glass of wine in the evening. Fast sugar. Fast meat. Fast a little portion. But there's things in our lives that come up now and again. And Abby and I will go, we're going to fast and pray about this. Because fasting moves the hand of God. You know, I tend to think of prayer as um, kind of like a, a, um, a, you ever seen a business check with two signature lines? You know, God's issued a check. And he's already signed it. But he's handed it to you and said, are you going to sign it too? And that's kind of what fasting does. You see Nehemiah really making a substantial sacrifice here. And fasting really moves the hand of God. You know, there's probably a couple extremes. You have one extreme who would go like, God's going to do what he's going to do anyway, so why would I pray? And there's, uh, you know, another extreme is kind of like a genie God. You know, God, give me this. God, give me that. That's kind of what you were saying. Is like, man, we, we come and we feel so self-centered. Every time I pray, it's just me this, me that. I, we need this. Our family needs this. And I think there's some spot in here where as you're fasting that weakness um, sort of produces a surrender to the Lord in your prayer life so here's what I want to do is I want to actually get um, vulnerable for just a minute and I want to tell you a little story in our life because I believe in story and I think I can give you points I can talk to you about prayer but I actually want to tell you about a prayer um, that we prayed these are little Ugg boots. Aren't they cute? Um, Abby, my wife, is sitting back there. And um, I should, I, I guess I need to tell you this. Um, I have a very um, painful testimony. And I have a very beautiful story of God's great grace, unmerited favor, and amazing, amazing redemption. So Abby and I are coming up on seven years of marriage. And um, for almost the first five, we couldn't have a baby. And I could actually take you and show you my uh, five-year journal. And um, it's really uh, shocking to me as I look back the magnitude of pain I'm expressing every day. Lord Jesus, there is such deep pain here. Lord Jesus, I don't know if Abby can make it through this. I don't know if we're going to make it through this. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. There's such pain that we don't have a biological child of our own. And we were about ready to give up, to be honest. But the Lord had really put in our hearts, we had sort of an unction, if you go back to my first point, that God wanted us to have kids. So we were like, no, God wants us to have kids. So she and I went out to, um, I think we went to Dillard's actually, all funny places. We went to Dillard's and we picked out a pair of Ugg boots. And we put the Ugg boots on our bookshelf. And every day we would say, Lord Jesus, would you fill those boots? Lord Jesus, would you fill those little boots? And when we got discouraged or we got angry or we got disappointed, we'd just look at them, we'd remind ourselves that, Lord, we believe that you've promised we're going to have kids. And we ask that you'd fill those boots. And it kind of reminds me of the passage in James that says faith without works is dead. We have faith. We're trying to have faith. We're, we're, we're surrendering. We believe, Lord Jesus. And this was kind of our, our works. This was our step. 
we're going to put a little symbol out there. And we're going to go, Lord Jesus, would you fill those boots? We have a three-month-old baby sitting back there right now. Now, is God always going to answer our prayers like that? No. No, I know people who've been praying, and I've been praying for things for years and years and years that I've yet to see happen. But I think what we see in the life of Nehemiah is a man who understands that prayer born of divine unction, that prayer seated fully in relationship with his maker, fully in relationship with his creator, knowing that God loves him and has good things in store for him, is the way prayer should happen. And there's something about taking some action, maybe fasting. There's something about pondering that positions our hearts in such a way that God can really break through in our lives. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just talk about God or read about God. I want to know this risen Savior that lives in me. My Bible says Jesus lives in me. Colossians 1.27, Christ in us is the hope of glory. And I want to walk with him in such a way where we go, little symbols like that. Lord Jesus, we're praying and we're believing that you would break through in this area. So here's how I actually want to end is I'm doing good. <laughs> this is, I want to actually, um, if there's something painful in your life, I'm going to have us pray. Let's do that. Let's bow our heads and let's pray just for a second. Lord Jesus, I think that um, everyone in the room would probably say we're all learning how to pray. None of us know how to pray. We don't even know exactly what prayer is. But we can certainly look at the life of Nehemiah and see a man who positioned himself before you in prayer, saw the divine unction, positioned himself relationally before you, fasted and sacrificed at times, focused on those who were needy, and gave himself to prayer. And here's what I want to do for a moment. If there is just eyes are closed, if there's someone in the room who's got a painful thing, I'm not going to ask you to speak it out, but if it's a painful something, maybe it's something similar to my little boots. It might be a marriage. It might be something with one of your children. It might be an adult child or grandchild that's in a painful place and you need hope and you need maybe a breakthrough there. Will you raise your hand? Just eyes are closed and I'm going to pray for all of us. Okay, I see those hands. More importantly, God sees those hands. Anybody else? Pray for anything. Anything that you're, you're struggling with. Okay, Lord Jesus, you see hands all around this little room. Father, we don't want to just read your word tonight. We want to be doers of your word. And so, Father, we come to you in many different facets from many different walks of life tonight. And, Lord, there's painful, difficult things in many situations, many families around this room. And, Father, in prayer, we ask that you would inject hope. Lord, I pray for endurance where endurance is needed. I pray for breakthrough in marriages and relationships with children, adult children, grandchildren. Lord, I pray for physical change and breakthrough. Father, we believe that you are a God who not only sent your son Jesus to die, but you sent him then to rise from the dead and then to live in us. So Father, as we carry him throughout our days, would you let us be found as a people in prayer? Father, not just rote prayer, not cold prayer, but prayer born of true relationship, prayer focused on divine unction. And Father, I pray for the breakthroughs that are needed around this room, that you would meet people in those spots. You're not a God who's afraid of the mess. You're not a God who's afraid of the fray. Jesus was born in a stable. We know you get right in there with us. So, Father, for this crew, would you bless them this evening? Would you bring breakthrough where breakthrough is necessary? In the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I love that, um, that Michael 
is here with us tonight because of part of that story he was talking about that is both painful and beautiful. We were really close friends, and there 